Thank you, Willis. A great message in that. Never give up. The scripture reading this morning is found in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Bernard? Yeah. Good morning. It is an honor and a joy and a high calling to speak to you this morning. An honor to be back home, so to speak. My wife and I were members here about 17 years ago, members for several years. We were here when the foundation was laid for the addition to the old Richdell Church, and it's now the Ripper Creek Church. And I merely, I have come home and have been here for uh, last year or so, back, back home with my church family. It is a joy. You know, we're here together. We are drawn by his love to worship together. We're here to encourage one another we're here to just uh, rejoice in the Holy Spirit's presence. And I can feel him present being here. And the high calling. You know, our wonderful Heavenly Father calls us here to speak well of him. And this speaking well of him happens more by what we don't say, by who we are. That reminds me of one of my favorite authors' uh, comment on this that I have right here in my Bible. So uh, let me share this with you. Found in Ministry of Healing 469. No other influence that can surround the human soul has such power as the influence of an unselfish life. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. The Christian's character is shown by his daily life. So we have that high calling to live a life which honors him, and then he, in turn, wants to honor us as well. Having said that, I'd like to have you pray with me as I pray for this message to come from him. Gracious Father, please speak your words through me so that we can hear you calling. We can feel your drawing us ever closer to you in a more distinct, focused way. And we can make up our minds that in the end, we want to fulfill your heart's desire to be where you are, as you've prayed there in a high priestly prayer. You want us to be so intimate with you right now that we be assured that you can take us to heaven with you and live there forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I'd like to speak a few words about the format of this uh, message <clears throat> that is entitled Called by His Love. We have heard the uh, scripture reading. What I'd like to do, but before we even go there, uh, this is going to be an interactive experience. I'm a teacher, therefore, I like to uh, get my students involved. So the first thing I like to do together with you, uh, to sing a little chorus with me. Uh, I'll sing it through uh, the first time, and those of you that already know it, join me, but then we'll sing it a second time so that those of you that are just learning it, we can have a, a nice, uh, strong chorus for the Lord. It is. Uh, 
A little chorus that says, Oh, how God loves you and me. So here we go. <clears throat> oh, how God loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He sent his son to die for our sins. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how God loves you and me. Sounds good already. Let's do it again. Oh, how God loves you and me. Oh, how God loves you and me. He sent his son to die for our sins. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how God loves you and me. Thank you, that sounded good. Having done this, let's turn together to, to read once more the text in Jeremiah 31, verse 3. So here we go. Turn to Jeremiah 31. Please open your Bibles and then just read with me. Even so, the translations may be different, but the chorus, you know, we'll speak in tongues here. The Lord will understand. The point is we read it together and slowly and distinctly so we can all hear it and even contemplate it while we are reading it. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Amen. In my Bible, I have this wonderful remnant Bible. Maybe some of you have that. There is a comment by Ellen White. She makes on that very verse. verse. I'd like to read that to you slowly and distinctly so we can take it in. It's found in the book, The Sigh of Ages, page 480. It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth from the manger to Bethlehem to Calvary's cross. And the sight of him attracts, it softens, and subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders. They hear his voice, they follow him. We've heard, knowing most of us, the principle by beholding, we become changed. And that's what happens. We have the privilege to behold him, to behold his love. <clears throat> my comments here, my faith journey of 72 years is going to be a vast sweep through the history of my life, all about the way that Jesus has drawn me with his everlasting love and keeps drawing me. It'll have three parts. Part number one, it's about Jesus. Part number two, it's about Jesus. Part number three, it's about Jesus. Let me be a little specific here. Uh, the part number one is how Jesus has let me and drawn me in the past. Part number two, how he is leading and drawing me right now. Part number three is how I'm expecting him <clears throat> to draw me from here on in the future. Three parts. So, in the past, I do need, I wish to speak a few words of my prison history. The most influential people in my life, of course, were my parents. <clears throat> I grew up in Germany during most of my life, well, to a great part, six years of World War II I experienced in Germany, in uh, near Mannheim, a city southwest Germany, near Frankfurt, you may have heard of Frankfurt, a city which, uh, with Ludwigshafen, on the other side of the Rhine River, was uh, targeted by 
anyway, planes many times. My dad counted on a calendar. There were 158 air raids to the city. Now, we were, fortunately, my, people, my parents had decided to live outside the city to buy an acre's worth of ground, which is a lot of ground in Germany. And my mom and my dad's help developed this beautiful garden and yard. With, we had all kinds of vegetables and so forth. Uh, now, my parents, one thing that has influenced me throughout my life is my experience with them early on. They were not Christian. My, uh, they were growing up in Christian homes. However, my mom and dad went through the First World War. My dad serving in the in, uh, German troops and was shot through the knee. Um, and oh, he never did limp, so that was fine. He came back. But what happened in the whole country, in the whole Europe, the institutions as they had been influential there have kind of failed the people. And my, my dad and my mom both, they were married two years after the end of the First World War, which was in, 2000, in uh, 1920. They were looking for something different. They were what you call the Wanderfögel at that time. Wanderfögel, which means it's a, the uh, birds, flying birds. They were similar like hippies. See, they, they got together singing around campfires and thinking, philosophizing, how can we improve upon the, the um, establishment which has let us down. So, even so, they were, they were very spiritual people. Let me tell you what, what I mean by that. They were not religious people. We didn't even have a Bible in the house. We do it when we ate a meal together. We assembled, we waited for each other, and then we prayed. We, we held hands and say, Gesegnete Mahlzeit, which means blessed meal time. Spiritual people, you know something? What really helped me is the way they lived and loved each other. Now, in Germany, in, uh, especially in Northern Europe, the, it, it's not the cultural thing, it's not to do a lot of hugging and kissing. I haven't experienced much of that. But I knew in my very heart my parents dearly loved me. I never heard them say a cross word in, their, in my entire life with them. There was no, there was maybe been frustration, but never irritation, never anger, or even, you know, an unforgiving spirit. I didn't experience that. When we sat together in the bomb shelters, there was never any fear. I never saw terror. We, we sometimes we heard the bombs coming down, down the road. The next one might be right on top of a house. You know, it went the other way, 100 yards. No fear. So that was great. It, I, I really respected them for that, and it has been with me throughout my life that that's the way to live. Fast forward, just one more comment on my parents. One reason they didn't go to church was, they said, our God does not enjoy burning his creatures, his children, everlasting fire. That's in our God. Ah, oh, aha. Uh -huh. And uh, so they had, they found much of their inspiration in nature, took me out in nature. Of course, I had two brothers, too. And I'm sure to sure refer to them. And, uh, but fast forward, to last comment on them, is uh, in, when my dad was 81, my mom was 80, they became baptized Seventh-day Adventist Church. <laughs> Amen. So uh, they, with the brunt of the war getting worse and worse, they sent me to the school out in the country. I, wanted, I didn't want to go. I said, I'll just soon be with you if you get killed. So, so no, 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 you have to keep, you have to need, keep the name going. You have to keep, no, no. So they sent me out there. I came late into the classroom there, uh, the boarding school for boys. And I had a problem because everybody had already their friends. And here I was pretty lonely and, and kind of, you know, on a fringe. But there was another boy who also seemed to be on the fringe, and we became fast friends. Come to find out, as I was walking with him, and we did a lot of things together, that he was an epileptic. Now, I was taught by my parents, everybody, God loves everybody, so you treat everybody as equals, and so I 
we had a good time together. But one time, and I still remember his name, Werner Wipper, just a Wipper, just like Wipper Creek. Werner Wipper did something or said something to me which I was upset about. Now, I have a type of uh, anger that's eaten in. You heard, heard that? Bitterness, right? Yeah, I had that. So I would never blow up at anybody. I was non-confrontational, but I sure to, He came to me, he wanted to apologize. Oh, Baron, Baron, they call me Baron over there. Baron, uh, I just turned away from him. I, I acted like he wasn't even there. I'm a total rejection. And I saw the pain in his eye, his heart, right, looking down through the eye. And so, yeah, that, that's what it is, sir. But I had in mind, oh, I'm just going to let him fly a little bit for two or three days, and then I'm, then I'm going to make, make up. Why? But before the two or three days went, went up, he was gone. His parents came because it got, it got so bad. They came, picked him up. I was left the only one in that school because my parents couldn't come. The war had rolled over where they were at and now approaching where I was at. So I could not. What happened, since I'm a sensitive person, my guilt started mounting up. I didn't know anything about Ten Commandments, but there was guilt there. I saw the eyes when I recall, still how hurt, I, how much I hurt him. I couldn't even, I couldn't even make up. And the guilt kept mounting and mounting. Now fast forward, after the war, my dad, chose to send me to a Catholic school, of all things. Well, the Catholic school was the first school opening in the area. He was believed he had a doctor's degree in chemistry. He was a research scientist. He believed this boy needs education as soon as possible. Public schools were still closed. The Catholic school, however, was, it was uh, started by the town of Fierenheim, a town about five miles away from us, by the town, municipality, and by the church. So they had to have admit anybody and everybody, and uh, Protestants or Lutherans had their own religion class, and then uh, Catholics had their own, and I attended the religion class of Pfarrer Taltmann. Pfarrer is a pastor in German, and he, he was a chaplain to the troops in Russia. He had lost his leg, and he was teaching away in that class, and I was not interested at all what he was saying, I was sitting there cleaning my fingernails one day, <laughs> and he sent me to the principal, and the principal was, what are you here for? Uh, I said, oh, I, I cleaned my fingernails. What, what did you do? I said, yeah, but why did you clean your fingernails? He said, well, I, I was bored. Oh, you were bored. I expected the Board of Education to be used on me because that's what they still did at that time. But you know, the principal said, after school, you go, See Pfarrer Taubmann, apologize to him. And that's just what I did. Yes, sir, that's what I did. I went there to the German, to the Lutheran parsonage, very small church, Catholic church, almost like a cathedral there, right? But I went there, and he came down inside his house um, with his crutches. I could hear him come down, open the door, and I said, oh, he came out. I said, whoa, now, maybe I'm going to get it from him. No, he, he gave me a hug and said, come on in, I want to talk to you. And so he talked to me. He talked to me about Martin Luther. Uh, would you please uh, study, would you be interested in studying this biography, three, three volumes of biography of Martin, Lu Martin Luther? I said, oh, yes, sir, I was a captive audience. So I took it home. I started studying about Martin Luther. Martin Luther became my hero. You know, from a D in religion, I ended up with an A, and I wanted to be... Well, in the Lutheran church, they baptize infants by sprinkling. Uh, they, they, however, they have such a, you may have heard of a service of confirmation, a confirmation service. Well, first you go three months to a course of training, it's like a Bible study. And I did that, and I was confirmed in the Lutheran church into Christ. I was, uh, I became a believer 70, 72 years ago. So, I had a, a, a hero, Martin Luther, and my other hero was Pfarrer Trautmann. And Pfarrer Trautmann said this, I never forgot. This is a lesson I'm still thriving on today. But he said, because I said, you know, here I had this huge load. And he said, look, band, 
you have done everything you can. You have repented of it. First of all, you have been convicted of sin. You have found repentance. You have confessed your sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive us. Yes, you need is forgiven. It's gone. It's, whoa, it's off. It's off of me. What a relief that was. And then I said, now what? What can I do for my Lord? What is my part in it? He said, okay, yeah, let me show you what your part is. Yeah, you have a part. Because God can't do it alone, and you can't do it alone. It's cooperative, okay? So what do I part? He said, well, get up on your tippy toes, right here, up on the tippy toes. Now reach up high. Now he had very high ceilings. Reach up high, okay? What do I do now? He said, you know what? That's all you can do. God is reaching down with his hand, grabbing yours and lifting you all the way up. That's all. I said, oh, I see. That's, that's as easy as it is. Well, he said, it may be easy, but it's not uh, simplistic. It may be simple, but it's not simplistic. In other words, our part is admitting that we, have, we are unable to handle life ourselves. The only way to recovery is come back to where what we've been created for, that is to be created in the image and in the likeness of God. Consequently, we fell. We all partake of the fall with original sin and then how to come back. As he started to figure it out, he had a plan. He had a plan. However, what we need to do, get up on our tippy toes, so to speak, and reach out to him to let us pull out of the mire, and he will do it. That's my testimony of 72 years as a Christian, that he has never yet let me down. That doesn't mean he hasn't given me some hard times. No, I shouldn't put it that. That's almost sounds... Let me never rephrase that. God has permitted for consequences in my life to take effect. The consequences I have found to never be punitive, which means God didn't come down hard and say, hey, I'm going to let it, this guy, he's not even doing what I'm talking about. I'm going to let, you know, I'm going to let it have him. You know, he, he deserves it. No, 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 that's not my God. No, he says, Hebrews 12th chapter, I believe, he says, whomsoever the Lord loves, what does he do? He chastises, he scourges every son that he receives, scourging, ouch! I mean, scourging, this is what Jesus got. 39 really hard hits on the back with, you know what? Uh, it, it, it's, yeah, anyway, it, it, it's, it's serious. So I have received some serious rebukes from the Lord. Always, always to bring me back. And so that's what he does. He, uh, he brings me back. And he continues to bring me back. Praise his name. So let me move fast forward here because we are now in the, we are still in the past. We, um, so how did the past develop? I um, graduated from this Catholic school out by the Magnus Schule in Fernheim. And I went on to serve the Lord. I thought the best thing for me would be a pastor. So I studied Lutheran um, theology at the University of Heidelberg for one semester, having to study Hebrew first in order to be able to get a, a reading knowledge of the, of the Old, Old Testament in the original tongue. And I found so, I was so disappointed because it was like they were taking the Bible apart, uh, failing to put it back together again. So I went on to a smaller seminary in Bavaria where I t took the Greek. And here again, it was, uh, well, something better. I received the call in another form. I was not so sure the Lord would have me just get up there on a podium. And in Germany, in Europe, they have, usually they have the, the places to speak from way up high. And the pastors speak down to the congregation. No, 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 no. I, I'd rather be down. On, I was considering to come down here today, but then my brother David said, no, the people up here can't see you, so I'm still up here. But I'm still leveling with you because we are all, we have all one thing, two things. We have a lot of things in common. We're all sinners. We all have a savior. And we all need to go to him to help us be saved. So I, the call was 
put forth by the Lutheran authorities that they, they were, they had several institutions to help to like nursing homes, hospitals, and one great big mental hospital. And they needed help there real badly. So I said, okay, maybe my Jesus would probably be in the mental hospital. And that's why I went there to work as a ward, as an aide in one of the wards. And that was that went on for a while. And I had made a friend at uh, this Lutheran seminary in Bavaria, Hans Rau, who had opportunity to come to the United States and work a year on a farm. Now he had to come back. The farmer said, do you have somebody else that wants to come? And he said, oh yeah, my friend, Baron, they call me Baron over there. Said, so I got to go over to the United States and I worked on this farm for a year. Uh, after that, I wanted to go back. The farmer said, why don't you see? And I said, well, I need to get some more training so I can figure out what to do with my life. Well, you can do it right here. So I said, OK. So I uh, enrolled at Michigan State University, close to where the farm was, 50 miles away. And I went there, still working on the farm, milking cows in the morning, hitchhiking over to the, to the university and then coming back. And I got acquainted with my wife-to-be. And we've been married for 62 years, married in a Lutheran church, and now seeking for a, a community of believers that was uh, a little more, well, going into depth what it means to have a relationship with Jesus and to be genuine, transparent about it. So I switched over to the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor to, to major in, in teaching. And there we sometimes went to used bookstores. We found a book, used book for 50, no, 75 cents. It was entitled Christian Education by a certain E.G. White. It was 19, 1898 copy. It was a forerunner of the, what's now known as a book of education. My wife and I read through this very quickly. And we said, this is a, we need to find out where this woman comes from. She's inspired. We knew this in our hearts. This woman is inspired. So we found the Church of the Woman, we, and uh, we became both baptized in the same water in 1963. And that was 55 years ago that I have been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian now. And then fast forward again, because we still have, we're still in the future. You have to, to cover the, we want to cover the present and, and no, we are still in the past, all right? So I have accepted the call to teach in elementary schools, mostly Seventh Avenue elementary schools, for about 20 years. And then we, uh, we travel about quite a bit from different to school to different schools. And then we, we raised some four children, four grown children, they're not grown now. And we, we realized that it was our, the employment opportunity at the academies of our church for getting less and less and you know academies were getting away from giving practical experiences to the students who worked their way through school so we my wife and I started to to we started some bakeries several bakeries here and there a couple of them for academies for the to have uh, for the young people have opportunity to work but not only that for us it was an opportunity to teach health health for living because there is a text in Scripture that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so we want to give people a taste of what it means to have your know, wholesome bread. And so this just went well for some years. And then we started a couple of restaurants, not together. So that was our last work we did. Before, we, uh, someone, we had some friends on the big Isle of Hawaii. Someone invited us to come over there and possibly find a home there. And we went, we did. And so four years between 2012 and 2016, we spent on the big island of Hawaii, developing this 10-acre place out in the boonies. Uh, so that was the last venture we did, until it brings me to the present. Then from, uh, af shortly after I returned from there, 2016, I became a member here again, where I had been 17 years before. So it's a homecoming to me. And so that brings me now into the present. In order to get to the present and get to the text, 
that will highlight the present. Let's turn to John 12, verse 28. Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, to the 12th chapter, and we will be reading verse 28 together, and then I will comment on it. John 12, 28. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Amen. <coughs> About three years ago or so, I was reading Bible through again and I came upon this verse and it struck me almost like lightning. I, was, I remember I read it in the evening and during the night it came to me, hey, there's something about this verse that I, I need to appropriate. Something the Lord is talking to me in a very special, personal way. This verse must be my outcry. Jesus cried out, Father, glorify thy name. That must become my outcry. Now what does it mean, glorify thy name? The name of God is his character. Glory, the glory is a visible manifested appearance of God's character. Fatsara in Latin means to make. So what we are told to do to make God's name apparent to others or to show it up in order to deflect it in a way that others will notice it and be drawn to him. What I've said before, however, this is not so much a matter of talking to people, even so I'm here now talking. It's, I wouldn't be here talking unless I had done some praying and I had some life behind it. So I have the, the boldness to come here and talk to you about experience that's real, about experience that's real with him. And that's why before I get up in the morning, before I ever get out of bed, I say, Papa, no, my father in heaven, I say, show me what our journey is today. Show me how we work together today. What's my, how are we, what, what, what adventure are we having today? Like in this famous prayer by one of my countrymen, Reinhold Niebuhr, you know, you, some of you may know the serenity prayer. I'm only quote one verse of it, I mean one line of it, taking one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time. That's the only way to live. We only live right now. This now, today is the day of salvation. Now is except the time. Many of us been there, done that, live either in the future, in the past, or in the future, and the day right here, this time is wasted. And so, no, God has a plan for you and me, for this day, for us to be very intentional about glorifying his name. So now, let's see how we are going to wrap this up pretty soon, because I didn't tell you this, I want to tell you right now, the last 10 minutes of the message will be interactive in the sense that it'll be a question and answer period. So think about some of the questions you may have since I covered such a huge time period. You are welcome to ask any questions you wish, and I will respond to that. But before we get there, let me go on to the future now, part three. How Jesus will continue to draw me in the future. Let's turn very close to where we were. John 17. We go now to John the 17th chapter, and we read verse 24. John 17, please, verse 24. This is what we find there. Now this is, let me just interject. John 12 was before the conversation Jesus had with the disciples in the upper room, Thursday night. Before that, Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples for what's ahead, that he was going to be crucified. They wouldn't even believe it, or they, they, they were very, very hard of uh, understanding of that. Now, comes down to John 17. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer. And we, we have read, many of us know, many of the verses there, one of the verses, 
One of the series of verses talk about unity, that we are united in Christ, together in Christ. But this is, this is so, something further on, beyond that. Verse 24, let's read. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Wow. Jesus' heart's desire is to show us the Trinity love that the family in heaven has for each other, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a Trinity. The Trinity is a family. How can you have one person like the devil has a counterfeit for the Trinity. His counterfeit is only one person, it's one devil. So, so the devil says, yeah, yeah, I have love. I, I love, I love. You see. But what does he, who does he love? He loves himself. <laughs> so that is the counterfeit. No, there's a Trinity to show us what real love is like. Now Jesus is saying to you and to me, I want you to be so intimate with me right now, right now, so close that we'll walk right into heaven together. That's his invitation. And I will tell you about the call. And I have asked uh, Lonnie, would you come up? And he's going to play some, some soft hymns when once I get stopped talking. Uh, this is the call. You've heard my heart's outcry. You've heard Jesus' outcry. You've heard my story being drawn by his love. If indeed these few words have made that call this drawing more distinct in your life, then come forward. If indeed you have decided because you hear the drawing, you're yielding to the drawing, that now you want to know how do I glorify you on a daily basis, then do please come up. And then I will speak the... Uh, the prayer, the benediction over you once you come up. Have you heard, have you felt his drawing power closer at this time than before? Have you decided to want to give Jesus his heart desire? To follow Jesus and say, yes, I want to follow you. Yes, I want to be where you are. Right now you're praying for me in heaven, in the most holy place of heaven. He is praying for you, for us right now, that there'll be people willing that say, yes, we need to be willing to be convicted, to repent, to confess, and then to be drawn ever closer. And before I'm going to speak the benediction, I want to explain to you what that means. I'm going to speak the uh, Aaronic prayer. And the Aaronic prayer is talking about a double blessing. God doesn't just have a simple blessing for us, a single blessing. And uh, the, the double blessing, some people think I used to think it's just like an ice cream cone. You have one dip and then you put another dip on, right? This is a double blessing. That's not what the double blessing is about. Let me tell you, the double blessing is about being when God can smile on us. God wants to smile on us. God wants to favor us. He, he wants that everybody can sing. He wants to smile on everybody, but he cannot smile on anybody who refuses to be drawn, refuses to come into Jesus' company and yield to Jesus' desire to have an intimate relationship with him. So in that now, since you understand, what, oh, one more, let me tell you about a mother. I had the privilege of uh, helping two of my children, two of my daughters be born. The privilege of actually helping them be born. Uh, there came a time when my wife, she nursed them all. She nursed them when the time came when this little one would look up to her and smile. She was ec ecstatic. Look, look, baby smile. You know, this is what God can do. He can smile on us when we get on his page. When you get in tune with him, always say, Lord, I can't handle it. I want to reach up like I did 
on my tippy toes. You come down and pull me up. So now we'll pray the uh, ironic prayer over you as we close the service. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious upon you. May the Lord favor you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus and for his sake, amen and amen. God bless you today and every day. <laughs>